Welcome to Veronica Live, and we are here with uh, candidate for Bay County Sheriff Andy Hooser. And um, Andy, welcome to Veronica Live. Good morning. How are you? Great. So tell everybody uh, what you've been up to before deciding to run for this um, big position here in Bay County. I recently retired from Bay County after 22 and a half years. My final position with the sheriff's office, I was the emergency response director. My main responsibilities was the day-to-day -day operations of the 911 center and the dispatchers and also the emergency management portion of the sheriff's office for response to any organized events or any natural or uh, human-made disasters. So obviously you were in the position when Hurricane Michael happened. So tell us about that experience. That was my introduction to emergency management. I was with the law enforcement liaison up at the Emergency Operations Center. So I was the eyes and ears for the sheriff and the agency up in the EOC prior to landfall, during and after landfall of Hurricane Michael, making sure law enforcement coordination was done, communications were brought back up in different areas of emergency response after the storm. And um, tell us, Andy, why you're running for this position now that you're retired. You know, most people go into retirement and, you know, relax a little. And you want to be our sheriff of Bay County. And, and why is that? Leadership is an important thing, especially in today's society with law enforcement getting back with the community, teaching the deputies a better way to interact with the community. The 60s and 70s models of law enforcement is way gone. Now law enforcement is more ingrained with the community, more in touch with the community, more of a helping hand rather than the disciplinarian of the communities. The big thing is, you know, focusing on teaching leadership to the newer and younger deputies so they understand what the main focus is and keeping the community safe. And what do you think of some of the issues we have here in Bay County are? Well, spring break, which thankfully is not like it used to be back in the early 2000s, but during the summer times on the weekends, we have an influx of tourists. We have an influx of visitors. The, the community is growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, every street you go down, you're seeing a new subdivision getting built or a new apartment complex getting built and need to focus on the community safe, the safety, keeping the community like it was 20 years ago, where it's a, a, a safe place to be. It's a fun place to be where people can relax and enjoy their lives and not have to worry about what's going on around them. So I, I feel pretty safe always here in Bay County, but do, what do you think some of our, our biggest issues are? You know, because fentanyl is definitely out there, and then people are always talking about human trafficking. And, uh, you know, I have naive people I know that say it doesn't happen here in Panama City. So I wanted to know your thoughts on uh, the drugs and human trafficking here. The drugs, the, it starts at the border security, the influx of the heroin, the influx of the fentanyl. Now they're, we've seen cases where they're mixing the fentanyl with heroin. They're mixing fentanyl with cocaine. And that's an extremely dangerous drug on its own. But mixing it with other illicit narcotics, you're seeing an influx and in, an uptick in overdoses, overdose deaths. You're, you're yeah. seeing uh, you know, lives getting ruined by, by the, this not new drugs, just the, the reintroduction of these older drugs back into the communities. Uh, I've worked special events before where I've seen firsthand the effects of fentanyl. I've seen firsthand where deputies and other law enforcement have dealt with the fentanyl that have had uh, adverse reactions to it, to where now there's, they manufacture special gloves for the uh, law enforcement so they don't get that induced into their systems. Right. And and his uh, co-host John Salik, I wanted to follow up uh, with you on that on that comment about about changing the policing, you know, modernizing it, or you know, uh, versus what what it's been over historically. Uh, you know, what we see on on the television are a lot of these breakdown in civil society. You know, you have these the smashing grabs. You know, I've, I've seen seen videos of the police driving by while people are shooting at each other, and the police just keep driving on by in, in these big cities. Is is that is that coming to us? Is that coming to Bay County, or is that is that just something that's, you know, you know, where 
I guess people just give up in the big cities, you know, on on trying to do anything because they can't get the criminals prosecuted. So what's the point of even stopping, you know, if nobody's going to do anything with it? That I would say is I wouldn't say it's definitely coming to Bay County. There there are situations, you know, bad guys have cars. They do travel um, back spring break. You know, the the college students, unfortunately, become a target of the criminals. Uh, and accountability for law enforcement, you know, a, a cop driving past somebody shooting at each other, that is completely, one, irresponsible. It's negligence of their duties. You know, when you swear in as a law enforcement officer, depend, you know, no matter what uniform you wear, you're, you're swearing to protect the community around you. Uh, and we need to get back to getting out with the community, getting to know who your community is, getting to know who your community leaders are talking with them, seeing what their concerns are. Back in the 80s when the COPS program started, getting into those communities that want to see law enforcement come in and help them clean up the, the bad elements in their, in their, in their areas. Uh, you know, unfortunately, crime is everywhere, no matter where you are, the smallest town or the biggest city. But it's staying ahead of that crime wave and staying proactive with the community and, and getting out there and just meeting with the leaders of, of each small community within the county and seeing where their concerns are. Andy, tell me about um, human trafficking. Do you think that's a huge problem here in Bay County? I wouldn't say it's a huge problem. It's a problem. It's, uh, I believe Panama City Beach uh, police made an arrest either yesterday or the day before on, on somebody for human trafficking. So it's here. It's just not out in the forefront like the bigger cities, but like everything else, it's a crime, and it's going to be in the communities, and you know, we got to keep keep ahead of it and keep uh, arresting the, the bad guys for this before it gets out of hand. Yeah, well, Andy, as, as a gun owner, one of the, you know, and as a lot of people in Bay County are. Oh uh, yes, <laughs> I, I, I'd like to know what's your, what's your position on open carry. I, I've been pushing, you know, our legislative delegation to to go there. And uh, and there's there's been a lot of hesitancy, and a lot of it's driven by by the Florida sheriffs not wanting to support open carry. I'm just curious where where you are on that. The the good thing about open carry is they're properly trained for their weapon. If someone knows you're armed, they're going to be a little bit more hesitant to to do something towards you because they know you're armed. Uh, the other good thing about open carry is if you make contact with law enforcement, they obviously know you've got a gun because they can see it in plain sight. And looking at open carry, it's been like that really for the history of hunting in the state of Florida. If you think about it, during hunting season, every contact a fish and wildlife officer makes is somebody that's armed. It's an open carry situation. Well, yeah, um, I, I, know, so, I know when I was growing up, you know, uh, this is a long time ago, <laughs> uh, you know, going, going to high school and stuff, you know, we had gun racks in, in, you know, in the truck and you go hunting in the morning and that kind of stuff uh, before school. And, and nobody ever said anything about anybody that had a gun, you know, a student had a gun in their, in their car or their, their truck, you know, in the parking lot. And, and uh, you know, I, I just kind of agree. You, know, you can be responsible. It's not, it's, it's not this wild West thing that people seem to make, make it out to be. Exactly. And I think one of the best things that the state of Florida did was institute the constitutional carry where if you're legally allowed to carry a firearm, you can carry a firearm. It is for your own protection. No, that's great. And one of the things on your Facebook page, Andy Hooser for Bay County Sheriff, you talk about this project that you help implement um, called the Bay County Emergency Alert for Children in Emergency Situations. So talk about that. County Commissioner uh, Claire Peace came to the sheriff's office wanting some type of an alerting system for the Sandy Beaches regarding children. Um, you get a child missing on the beach, somebody walks away, a, a parent turns their head for two seconds, and next thing you know, th their child is, is missing on the beach. That program, we, we could actually put the information in very quickly, and it goes out to everybody's cell phones through alert, through the alert bay system. It notifies the beach vendors. Um, Commissioner Peace got us the contact numbers for all the condominiums, so the condominium leadership knows that there's a child missing on the beach. It cuts down on the time delay for looking for lost children out on the sand. 
And that was actually the second program that I put together for the sheriff's office. The first one we called, I call it CARES. It's child cares alerting and response to emergency situations. How that system works is if there's a law enforcement situation, they, the dispatcher can put the address in that section of the alert bay and it automatically notifies any child care facility within a one mile radius of where that law enforcement contact is happening. So the daycare administrators can make the decision whether or not to lock down their facility for the safety of the children. Example, you know, deputies or, or police are in a foot pursuit. The daycare can lock the doors to make sure the person trying to flee law enforcement doesn't run into the daycare and endanger the small kids. That's great. You know, Andy, one of the things I'm, I'm curious where, where you are, you know, it, I see a lot of, of police departments that have really become militarized in, in a lot of senses, and, you know, with, with the, uh, uh, you know, the, the armored vehicles, you know, the used <laughs> surplus military stuff and, and the SWAT teams and all that. Uh, do, do you think that's an overused or over overly aggressive policing tactic or or is that is that something that just it's because of the way our society is today that w that we need that th those capabilities in the police departments well I, I wouldn't say the society I think it's a great tool for specialized teams like SWAT teams it protects the officers that are getting engaged in a potentially deadly force situation it cuts down on you know the the deputies having adverse conflicts with someone that potentially armed um, and it's also a show of force you get uh an mrap or you get an armored vehicle show up at the front door of somebody's property that's armed and dangerous they may consider twice before they do anything worse and surrender peacefully to law enforcement and it's protecting everybody else involved uh, the reason i asked that question was was uh you know the optics sometimes just do not look right and there not not long ago there was a there was a national guards guardsman that was arrested for uh for espionage basically for for stealing stuff and and the the video was just to, to me it was appalling because they had you know here's just here's this guy he's like surrendering hands on his head and all this kind of stuff he's standing outside in front of his house in in shorts or whatever and and they've got the police driving up with the mrap <laughs> And and they've got you know like fifteen guys with guns pointed at them, and it's like, you know, this I, I understand the safety of the, the officers and stuff and all that, but but at some point it just it seems to be overkill, <laughs> you know. Does it does it require that that? I, I mean, are the optics for the television cameras, or is it or is it they actually trying to affect uh, a arrest of a, a what I would consider a very low threat person? I don't think it's as much the optics for the news media and the television as much as the overall safety, but that goes into my next uh, platform that I'm, I believe in is the local law enforcement needs to embrace a community uh, interaction or not oversight committee, but a community, uh, community review committee where different persons throughout the community come in and help review use of force situations, body camera situations, pursuits. That way you can get the outside opinion of the community on what needs to be improved on, what was good, what was bad, and those, those optics you're exactly talking about. Law enforcement shouldn't hide from the community their tactics and what they're doing. It should be a glass house. The community should know everything that's going on within that agency, you know, barring stuff that you know is being held for trial. But the community needs to be aware of what's going on and a, a community committee to help review those situations and get their opinion on those optics, I think, should be in every law enforcement agency. Some of the bigger sheriff's offices in the state are, have embraced that program, and I think it's a great way to proceed in the future with law enforcement. You're not only getting community interaction, you're getting that community feedback, and you're getting where, what they're seeing at the end result of the, the situations that require a review. I, I think that's a great, great program. It sounds sounds like it's just, just right for, you know, uh, somebody outside looking in saying, hey, maybe you went a little, little overboard <laughs> uh, on that situation. Andy, I've exactly. got um, two red flag questions. One is 
what would you do about the beach red flags? Because last year we had record number of drownings and these people aren't getting it. So let me, that's the first red flag question. So we'll ask you about that one. I think the best thing the community, the county did was enforce the, the county ordinance for enforcement on that. Not everybody needs to go to jail. Not everybody needs a ticket, but there needs to be the education out there. And that's why the first contact with someone in the water on double red flags is a warning. Any subsequent that day, then it becomes a ticketable issue. Some people, you know, they're going to, they're going to push the envelope on what they can do. But red tie or red, excuse me, double red flag days and rip currents are extremely dangerous and People need to be aware of them. There are some tourists that come from middle middle of the United States that have never been exposed to the Gulf, and they need to be aware of the situation. And, and that's a good program um, with with the, the double red flags and keep people out of the water. It's for their safety. Well, it just was horrific last summer. The other yes. Florida red flag law um, I wanted to talk about, and that was passed because of the horrific 2018 mass shootings at Parkland High School. And police can now, you know, go to a judge and take away people's firearms. So I just wanted your position on on that red flag, because, you know, uh, the, what scares me is if somebody's making something up and then you come and take my weapons and now I'm unarmed. But I do want the wackadoodle not to have um, arms. So I wanted your thoughts on that. The risk protection orders have, in my opinion, both good and bad. The good thing is it gives law enforcement the ability to protect the person, protect their family, and protect the people around them if it's done correctly. If the evidence is laid out in front of a judge, and that's the the next best part about that is you have to go in front of a judge, and the judge has to sign that order saying to go ahead and seize those those firearms from that person. Uh, it, in my opinion, I think it needs to be a little bit different, but it's on the right path with protecting people. Is you know the first step is going in front of a judge and explaining the situation. And having them make the decision of whether or not there's probable cause to sign that order to go collect the firearms. Well, is there are there any issues that we're missing that you want voters to know about you, Andy? Why you should be the next sheriff? Well, the big thing is transparency. Law enforcement has come a long way. I am a big advocate of, of body cameras. That way, there's not just evidence you can see what's going on with those citizens interactions, whether good or bad. The good thing is supervisors can review the body cameras. They can look at them and they can address any potential issues with training or the way uh, law enforcement is handling that particular situation. But we need to get back to the basis of getting back with the community, getting out with the community. They are part of us and seeing what their needs are, what their concerns are, and what they'd like to see addressed. We need to get back to getting back out with that community on a daily basis and seeing what's best overall for Bay County. And, and why? Why? Is, go ahead. It's, the big thing is starts with transparency. It shouldn't be a secret what goes on in any law enforcement agency agency it shouldn't be the community shouldn't guess of what's going on the community should be able to know what's going on what happened why it happened uh, and being transparent in, in everything that's being done law enforcement's always been held per se to a higher standard law enforcement needs to be held to at least the standard that they expect the community to act and why, um, I, cause it, it's definitely, you know, Sheriff Tommy Ford's been there a long time and he has a big fan club. Why are you a better candidate than Sheriff Ford? My passion is with leadership, learning leadership, learning new skills, um, to the point that I went back and I've received my master's degree in leadership. And I'm currently working on my doctorate in leadership with organizational development and going back to servant leadership. One of the my idols when it comes to leadership is the president of the Barry Waymiller Corporation. If you ever get a chance to listen to some things that Bob Chapman does, he wrote a fabulous book on how important leadership is and how important it is. It's got to start at the agency. You've got to have the, 
the respect of the people that work for you. They've got to understand where you're coming from. But it needs to be that more of a family atmosphere where they're happy to be there. They're happy to go to work every day. They're happy to go out and help that community. And learning new leadership skills is only is not only benefit the agency, it's going to benefit the community as a whole. Excellent. Well, where can people find out information about your campaign, Andy? Well, right now I've got my Facebook page up, uh, Andy Hussar for Bay County Sheriff. And every day I'm going out, I'm going to different businesses. I'm introducing myself to the business leaders. I'm going out and introducing myself to the community. Uh, I've spent a lot of time at, um, in Lynn Haven, speaking with the community in, in Lynn Haven and the north end of the county. Uh, and my, my phone number is published on the Facebook page. If anybody has a question, I am more than happy to sit down and talk to anybody that wants to know what I'm about, what my visions are, and how I want to make not just the sheriff's office a better place, make Bay County a better community and a safer community. And um, when is the primary for this election for, the, for everyone listening? The primary is August 20th. We have to have our qualifications done by May. So right now I'm working on getting my petition signed so I can get on the ballot. I've got to have a little over 1,200 petitions. So I'm working on that. And okay. when I'm handing out the petitions, I'm talking to the people. So if they have any questions, they can ask me, you know, what I what my opinion is on different topics. Well, we've been talking with Andy Hooser. He's running for Bay County Sheriff. And we'll have you back, Andy. Good luck with the campaign. Thank you. And we'll be right back on Veronica Live.